once again after a few years barry you just pointed out it was 2017 since you were last on wow. correct jimmy that's correct yeah nice to meet you we should do this every uh how many years is it <laughs> we've both aged like five or six years since the last time yeah. oh don't i know it oh my god yeah mm. anyway right. it's great to be talking to you once again my friend yeah, yeah yeah um new album lockdown coming out october 20th on roulette records this Correct. Is the new thunderstick album it's been a while since six years, I guess, seven years. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it has been. It's been quite a while. It wasn't intended to be that long. I mean, I was looking at, I actually put the drum tracks down for that album um, just before uh, Christmas mm-hmm. 2019. And the deal was that I was going to start track laying in earnest in 20, 2020, so that the album could be out on 2020. But as we all know, um, along came COVID and kind of put play to all that. It, it, it wreaked havoc with, with my band because um, uh, I ended up with two guitarists leaving um, because they they just didn't feel part of it anymore because everybody was self-isolating. And it was a shame. Mm-hmm. And it left just the hardcore three of us, which was Rex, my bass player, uh myself and the wonderful singer raven blackwing and um i asked a load of people i i I started you know calling friends and saying do you know anybody that would fit the thunderstick remit you know the theatrical side of things and you know just the general playing and and we're a power rock band i don't ever really regard myself as a as a heavy metal musician, I don't think we're metal enough to actually be called that. But that is a kind of, you know, a, a, the dichotomy of that is that I'm known for the new wave of British heavy metal and was once the figurehead for that movement, which is kind of strange. But, but anyway, yeah, I called a load of friends and done um, a lot of them came back and said, well, we don't know anybody that we could recommend for live shows, but we'd be more than happy to put some stuff down on the album if you're doing an album. And I, I kind of hummed and hard and thought about it for a while. And then I thought, you know what, I'll do that. Why not? What's better than having a load of friends that are really musically competent to play on your album? And I ended up doing that. So I have guest artists all over the place. I have a, a guy called Marius Danielson who, um, uh, he he puts a lot of symphonic metal albums out. Um, mm-hmm. He's from Norway. Um, I also have Dave John Ross, who used to play with uh, the new uh, Wobbum band More. Yes, of course. Um, I, yep. I have um, my ex-guitarist Dave Kilford on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's a couple of other people as well, which I can't. <laughs> Terry Warpan. Oh, Terry. Yeah, of course, Terry Wapron's on it. Yeah, there you go. Um, the, uh, was, uh, one of the I, old old uh, sort of classic Iron Maiden guitars. Yeah, so. same time as me. I mean, mm-hmm. he was in the band at the same time as me. And and what's happened with the album is because of the input of everybody's playing style, I have got such a varied album. And um, f- funny enough, the, the main job I had with it was trying to make everything a composite so that it sounds like an album rather than random tracks that have been played here, there, and everywhere. Mm-hmm. And I took a long time to do that, but I got there in the end, and I'm really happy with it. I think the material is really strong. Um, there's a lot, of al- a lot of material that I wrote back in the day that had never – it had got to demo stage, but it had never actually seen the light of day as be- becoming a master. So I, I dipped into some of those. And then um, I started co-writing with other people, like, as I say, Dave Kilford, the ex-guitarist, uh, Rex, my bass player. And that's been a breath of fresh air for me. I mean, because up, up until now, as you probably know, with 2017, everything to that point was me. It was Thunderstick was my baby. I produced it. I, I arrange it. I write all the lyrics, et cetera, or had up until this album. And I've uh, uh, my 
vocalist Raven has written uh, set, uh, two songs, lyrics, and absolutely astounding lyrics. And I think to myself, this is great because I can I can use these people to input into Thunderstick. And it just makes it fresher. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> So looking forward right. to hearing that. We've only heard the single so far, of course, but the album's yeah. not far away. What is the release date, Jimmy? It's uh, October, October the 20th. Yes, October 20th. the 20th. Yeah, yeah. we put the single out um, because that's been in the set live. And we had a lot of people li liking that and, um, you know, really appreciated it live. So it, it also shows that um, a lot of people in two that with the album Something Wicked This Way comes back in 2017 jumped on to the fact that it had its had its history to it. Um, it was of the time, it was of the now, but I was going back and and you know kind of tipping my hat to a new album of the 80s and, and around that time. And so that album was actually quite bare as far as mixes go. And a lot of people really appreciated that. They, you know, they said, oh, it's great because it has relevance of now, but at the same time, you can hear that, you know, it, that new Wobham influence. This album is a little bit more technical, um, and I've been able to play as a producer on it, uh, mm -hmm. which I thoroughly enjoy. I, I actually love that. I love the arrangement and, and production of the album so barry yeah. barry also the first single is a is a re-release of don't sleep with the enemy which was on your last album correct yeah go sleep with the enemy yeah go yeah. sleep with the enemy i dare you yeah <laughs> um I, I had to have um raven on it because her vocal is far more in keeping with the subject matter um you know of a woman scorned and all the rest of, <laughs> all the rest of that you know so uh, yes, and she she was able to actually, um, you know, she she put the power into it, which I didn't think was there on the original version. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people, as I say, like it like it live that track. So it it was a no brainer for me to to actually redo that and put the heavier guitars onto it, um, which is uh, the kind of direction. It's it's a good. It's a good precursor to the album because it shows that that the band are heavier on this album than they were on the other one. All right, right. And what Charles, about the uh, the the album title? Is that just is that just to pretty much sum up the period in which you were putting the record together, or was there a deeper meaning to that? Yeah, no, there is a deeper meaning to that, in as much as that. Right. Uh, it was originally going to be up until now. I, I tended to use five word titles like the live album in France, something wicked this way came, uh, the studio album, something wicked this way comes, uh, the, the album of all the remixed and remastered of all the uh, earlier material was called Echoes from the Analog Asylum. Uh, all five word titles, and this one was originally going to be called Beware the Dark Cabaret Hooligans. <laughs> and I just thought that was a great five. album. Yeah, five. Yeah, beware the dark cabaret hooligans. Um, Someone's going to nick that. That's brilliant. No, 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 no <laughs> they can't. They can't because what I've done on the sleeve is I have done a double artwork. We, we we use the same guy that we've always used, Baz Crowcroft. Um, he's he's our kind of Derek Briggs, as it were. He's all he's always done the Thunderstick, the, the later mm -hmm. Thunderstick albums. Um, and um, so he's done a, a double side to it. Um, the lockdown thing came about because everything was done remotely. We weren't. We were all in self isolation because of the directive given by the government, and you know it was worldwide. Plus the fact that nobody knew exactly what COVID was. We were wondering as to you know there were people dying right, left, and centre from this disease. So um, we weren't allowed to get anywhere near each other. And I made the decision to try and speed things up that everybody would play and, and record um, on their own gear, on their own software, uh, of which we did. Um, and the, the, difference, <laughs> the difference between the, the, the various guitarists was quite, you know, awesome. It was like, okay, I, I was left scratching my head and thinking, how am I going to make this composite, you know, this, this album? 
and it took a long time. And also the fact that most of the guitarists recorded their effects rather than putting down a clean track, allowing oh, me to of course, right, yeah. put the effects on later on at a later day oh, and boy, all that. Um, yeah, so it was crazy. And I thought after doing all this, it had just had to be called lockdown. But as I say, it's called lockdown, or if you want it, beware the dark cabaret hooligans, and you can swap the swap the pages and I, and I, over I find, on the CD. I find a lot of guitar players do that because bless them, they just they they have their sound and they don't want anyone changing their sound. So they are, oh look, because I mean I I produce records myself. And they're like oh let me send it to you with my effects. What no. they're basically trying to what they're basically saying there is let me send it to you how I want it to sound, <laughs> you know. And I mean, to a certain extent, um, I go along with that, obviously, yeah. because I want them all to be proud of what they've done on the album. I mean, I, I gave, say, Terry Wapram, for example, I, I got the remit I gave him was uh, Jimi Hendrix, please. And it has a long, the, the track that he's on has a long section of about three minutes. And he put down about seven different guitar tracks. And it was wonderful because they were all different. I was able to sort of intersperse them. Some of them I reversed and played backwards. And oh, it's just great. I loved it. So but the same with the other, the other, the other guitarists, all of them should be proud of what they've done on it. Barry, so. what can people expect when they go see a live show? So you have two dates coming up, two festival dates, I believe. Yeah. One in France, which is also uh Right act is co-headlining, correct, Charles? Yeah, like uh, right uh, before. Yes. Well, you're, right, you're headlining, right? Yeah, they're headlining, right? Oh. They're headlining, and we're special guests. So. Okay, I got you. Uh, what can people expect in terms of a set list when they go see Thunderstick? Are you tossing in the Samson stuff? Are you playing yeah. strictly Thunderstick? What are you uh, playing? No, I'm playing um, Riding with the Angels. We're doing Earth Mother. We do... Um, Oh God, what's the other one we do? Too close to rock from head on. Um, and what they can expect is the same as usual, a theatrical, you know, a lot of theatricality to it. Um, and Raven plays we we have a kind of storyline. It's 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 not a concept album or anything like that, but live we have a storyline and we record a lot of narrative um already down on you so that you know an mp3 or whatever so that in between the tracks this narrative takes over a storyline and so therefore um raven goes through many many character changes during the course of the gig uh which is great and you know i get to watch this from behind my kit i can i watch this lunacy that's happening <laughs> And <laughs> it really is. I mean, I like people to go away from a Thunderstick gig thinking how wonderful she was, but she was probably slightly unhinged. <laughs> 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 and that's kind of it, you know, that's the kind of way it is. So a lot of theatrical. We have loads of props. I mean, we should have a tour bus for the amount of props that we carry around with us. It's crazy. But there you go. I, you know, I, I I always worship at the altar of Alice Cooper. So, you know, yeah. it was it was always going to be that way. I mean, I was, that's uh, what you know, Giles. Before the show, he goes to me, Jimmy. Is he bringing his mask? So, did you have your you have your mask there? I know you have it there. I know you. Have yeah, it yeah. There. So it's somewhere. It? Yeah, I haven't got it here. But it's, uh, <laughs> it's somewhere. Do you have it? Do you have? Do you have it? No, no. It's it's all in my stage gear. So ready oh, to okay. go. Already packed. Just ready All right, we'll let it go. We'll let it go. We'll yeah. let it go. <laughs> so there's um, yeah, a fair bit of theatricality. Okay. All right. right. Um, awesome. And yeah, actually, let me show you this. I'll tell you what's funny. Yeah. I found it funny, though, guys, was that um, the main reason that I left Samson was because of theatricality. Um, we went through a period where uh, uh, music press – would only write about Thunderstick. And Thunderstick did this, and Thunderstick did that, and blah, 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 etc. And uh, there came a point where both Paul Samson and Bruce were really kind of um, getting cheesed off with all that. They were really getting fed up with it. And um, so Kerrang uh, did an interview with them, both of them, and they said, can we talk about the music instead of 
thunderstick goes mad and you know sets fire to his head or or whatever. And uh, so uh, let's talk about the music. And and he said, okay, I can't remember who it was. I think it might have been Dante Benuto at the time that did the oh, did right. the, the, did the interview. So when the interview came out, every single paragraph had a tiny little image of the Thunderstick mask all the way down it. And virtually the whole interview was Thunderstick did this and Thunderstick did that. And that led to a lot of altercation between myself and the others because I wanted to take the theatricality even further. And they didn't want it. And we did... um, I can remember we 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 were highlight uh, we were showcasing uh, shot tactics at the marquee, and I was really sort of alienated because they went on wearing jeans and Bruce wore a uh, rugby shirt or something like that, and he was really you know he was really against any kind of theatricals. I find it somewhat ar- ironic because if you see the Iron mm. Maiden shows of today. <laughs> Yeah, it's all it's all. But, but I'm gonna you... I'm gonna pause you right there, Barry. I'm gonna pause okay. you right there. Okay. So here it is. There's look at this. This is what they we had in Canada. We had the hand right. tactics, yeah. which was a yeah. and featuring. And I got <laughs> one too. <laughs> and here's the picture that you're talking about. I remember when I first got this when I was a teenager. Yeah. Who's this strange yeah, little yeah, figure right. here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a strange little figure. And then there's Bruce Bruce up here, right? Yeah, yeah. So this was this was I guess when Iron Maiden was first taken off in about eighty three eighty four. Well, yeah. this came this came this came out in eighty six on Capitol. Yeah, eighty five. Right. Eighty five. Like you're right. Eighty five because Rod Rod Smallwood has a little a little sort of excerpt here, like yeah, he just talks yeah. about it, the whole thing, right? I, I, he, got you know, the, he got in on the act. I, I'm I'm kind of sorry sorry to piss on your firework, guys, but I hate that album. I really <laughs> hate it. And the reason, well, we're, we're, but, but wait, but wait, we'll get into that. We'll get. Let's go back. Let's go back in time a little bit, okay? okay. Let's start off, and we'll kind of go build up to that oh, album right there. Right. That. That's okay with you. All right. That so here we go. Cool. Survivors. Okay. Yeah. Survivors. Let, let's talk about you joining the band here at Samson, and okay. And this is the reissue of it, of course. You know, yeah. With, yeah. With it. And just tell us about that. You know, unless Charles, have you have a more specific question on that? Okay. Well, um, the, I mean, the big. I guess the big question is: I mean, the, when the reissue came out, all of a sudden, here's seven songs, whether they're demos or whatever, re-recordings with Bruce. Was that was that done for any intent to sort of re- reissue the album, or just was it his audition, or what? What was the, well, what was was the reason? Well, uh, you've hit the nail on the head. It was just purely for a reissue. Because obviously um, the original album was a three-piece, which was myself, uh, John yeah. McCoy from Gillen, and Paul, uh, Paul Sampson. Yeah. And, um, I mean, we were a three-piece, and we had done – we were touring that album, the Survivors Tour. And um, at the time, CBS were interested in – in us um obviously cbs don't even exist as a, a record label anymore but they came along and saw us and the general consensus was we'll come back and look at you again if you can find a front man and so we started looking now i always loved a guy called gary holton um from a band called the heavy metal kids oh, I know yeah. I don't know if you're familiar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yes, I, I mean, he was the guy that played Wayne in Alvida's Um And we were really, you know, I would have loved him because he was so theatrical and he was so so right for the part. But he was going back into acting and, and it didn't happen. And Paul and I went out one night and we went to a pub and uh, there was a band playing in there and Bruce was the singer. It was a band called The Shots. Um, which was quite amusing because they were they had their stage set up in front of the toilets, the <laughs> restrooms, um, and Bruce was in and out, kind of just doing a few little silly costume changes. And his one thing that he did within the band was that he would pick out people in the audience and start, you know, verbally attacking them. <laughs> he did this to me. Because at the time I looked like Ronald McDonald, I dyed all my hair bright, bright red, <laughs> bright red, <laughs> and then it permed as well, like Paul Stanley, and it looked just oh. like Ronald McDonald. So he started in on me, 
And at the next opportunity, he went back back into the toilets to change, and Paul and I went in there. And he literally thought that we'd gone in there to beat him up. And <laughs> But, you know, anyway, long story short is that we spoke to him afterwards and we said, are you interested? And he said, I would really be interested, but I'm at university at the moment studying history and I'm just about to do my degree, etc." So in the uh, on the tour, he came used to come to any gig that he was able to get to, and he would get up and do the encore with us. So that was the story of survivors. Um, you know, the the management company said once he once um, I think it was after we'd released Head On that they decided that they were going to do that with survivors and put his vocal tracks on it, and and that was it. So yeah. So I mean, so, so the the album gets released. Bruce joins the band when Survivors re they release Survivors, but Bruce is on the album cover, correct? Uh, yeah, he's not on the album though. No, he's not on the album, but he's on the album cover as one of the uh, guy. I think he's like this one right here, right? Yeah, yeah. That's However, true. he doesn't sing on the album. Correct. Yeah, he does. And then when you're going into the next album, that's when you decide to do the the the, the vocals. Yeah. Vocals. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. But it never it never came out until like twenty years later when as part of the reissue though. Didn't it? Oh yeah, well the, the I mean, you know, the, the, the tapes were there. Um right. so I mean it was always it was always going to do that. But uh yeah, I mean that's exactly why they did it. So to reissue. How did the album right. do overall? I th I think it did all right, you know. I, I a lot of people actually look at that album and think that was one of the or was the first new Wobbam album. Um, okay. It was strange because uh, when I went to audition with, with Samson, um, uh, Chris Aylmer was there playing. And okay. uh, I was called back for another audition, the second one. And, and I'd met Paul several times beforehand before I actually walked into the audition. I walked in and went, oh, my God, not you. And he went, oh, not you, because we used to both rehearse in different mm -hmm. bands at the same place. And I, you know, I would be with my band going out, and he would be coming in, or vice versa. Good name for a track, that. But yeah, um, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I mean, we'd mess at each other, and as I walked through the door, he went, "Oh my God, you!" So Chris Aylmer did the first audition. I was called back, and lo and behold, there was John McCoy, um, huge, great, imposing man, you know, with a bald head, a great big fur coat on, and all that. And he stood about that far away from me. And we were doing one of the tracks called um, on that album, Six Foot Under. Mm -hmm. And he's just like a rhythm machine. He would just stand there with his head nodding like this. And he was just there to try and bum me out. And I thought, I'm not going to let you bum me out. So, you know, that's when I got the gig. So, and then after that, we went into the studio and everything was great. I love playing with Joel because he's such a rhythm. Is, 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 that, is that before he was in Gillen? No, he was in Gillen at that time. Yeah, he was already was at the same in Gillen. time, right? Yeah, and then, yeah. And then yeah. after how many years with this album? Like, what was it like eight months later? Head On comes out. Yeah, about uh, that. Yeah, yeah. So Bruce and, joins and, the band. And and this is the image that we're all referring to as sort of yeah. you were the poster boy of the yeah. new wave of British heavy metal. Of course, this wasn't yeah. the Kerrang image, but it was. No, it was on yeah. Sounds Mag. It was on Sounds. It was on Sounds. Magazine. It was on Sounds. Yeah, it was sounds, sounds. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I thought you know it was strange because when I started playing, there were not many uh, drummers that were recognised. There were the exceptions to the rule, Keith Moon, John Bonham, you know, people like that, Ian Pace, drummers that you would immediately recognise. But there were so many bands where you couldn't recognise, you couldn't tell who were the, you could name the guitarist or you could name the singer, but you couldn't say who the drummer was. And then once they started yeah. getting into releasing um, pictures of the bands, because the I mean, in the, the black and white rags, such as uh, Sounds and uh, Melody Maker and New Musical Express, all these these kind of once-a-week journals, they didn't really have a great amount of band photographs. And with the likes of Kerrang! and what have you, that all started and, and you got posters of, of metal bands or rock bands. But you'd always see the guitarist at the front doing this and the singer doing his posing and, and a row of symbols on the top of somebody's head. So that's how it came about. I thought I'd create a faceless drummer, and that's exactly what I did. 
and then called it Thunderstick because it wouldn't have sounded right calling it Barry Driver. Yeah, there it goes. Yeah, There's yeah, a yeah. side profile that you mentioned there before the guitarist. Yeah. There we go. The Samson yeah. years. I, I wonder if the sounds picture is here. I don't remember if it was or not. Uh, well, the no. sounds picture was the thing on the back of this, wasn't it? That was the that was no, it was no, it wasn't. It was uh, uh, no, it was, still, wasn't it? it was when no, you see it, you'll know exactly what it was. Yeah, it, it was sort that of like was, it, yeah. The photograph that's on the back of that one, uh, Head Tactics, is um, from a photo shoot that I did for for Thunderstick, my band, and I just used oh, is that, that right. Yeah, yeah. Well, just, let me try and, I'm going to try and bring up the sounds one on my phone here. So yeah, I can find it. I mean, the 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 Samson mask was really brutal. It was, um, you know, part of that reason was why why I went with a female vocalist within Thunderstick. But you know, that's a, a story in itself. Barry, but, so so the songs, right? The songs. So I and and everybody should understand as Samson is sort of developing as a band, and you're recording head on. At the same time, Iron Maiden is in parallel with you guys, right? Yep. Yep. So the famous Thunderburst controversy, oh. Thunderburst Gate, thunder, as I like to call it, Thunder. <laughs> maybe you want to. I know you've explained it to me in the past, but maybe you know you could explain it again for those folks. That's the one. There it is. That's there the it is. I stand corrected. There it is. Yeah, it yeah, is very yeah. different, isn't it? Yeah. How yeah. brutal is that? It's a, a, a brutal look. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no. I had, I when I, you know, when I put Thunderstick together, I had to soften it. And so, as you know, the mask these days is a, a little bit more contemporary than brutal. Yes. <laughs> that, that must have been a shocker for, must have been a shocker for just, you know, your, your, your high street stores carrying sound yeah. magazine. Uh, well, know. that's why, yeah, you know, the, the, um, the compilation album, the new album revisited compilation yes. yeah. album. The, I think Lars Ulrich put that together. Um, it had that picture right in the center of it, and they covered it up. Uh, they covered it up with some smaller photographs because some of the outlets, retail outlets, that it would have been on sale in, such as WH Smith's and what have you, thought that that image was far too stark and would frighten little old ladies and, and what have you. So they had to cover it up. So if Why was there, what was their reason? What was their reasoning? It's like it, you know, like it, it reminded people of like a balaclava sort of. Uh, in the UK at the time, there was a guy called the Cambridge Rapist. Nice. Oh right, okay. And the Cambridge Rapist was was uh, breaking into women's homes and raping them in their own home. And mm, guess God. what he wore? <laughs> yeah, that. he wore a balaclava such as that, and so. You know, sounds didn't help the matter because they used to do a little poll, um, the Christmas thing at, at the end of each year, and they would hand out all these little awards. And the best kept, best uh, dressed Cambridge rapist award goes to Thunderstick of Samson, <laughs> which yeah. is like, oh man, I you know I've always viewed Sa uh, Thunderstick as a, a bit of a knockabout character. He was always, you know, the he was always the victim. I always looked on him as the victim being rather than being the oppressor. So right. yeah, it's, it, you know, that was, that was horrible at the time. And of course, because that image, but, but look uh, at this, right? Heavily, yeah. It featured heavily on the posters for the live gigs that we did. And women's uh, activists started ripping down the posters and protesting outside the gigs that we were doing. So you know, some somebody pointed this out the other day a, a, a while back. The, do you have Iron Maiden Killers album there? Can you call it up on your phone there, Giles? Well, yeah. It, it's amazing yeah. how that yeah. image and Iron Maiden's Killers image, even though they weren't recorded at the same time. Yeah. But there's a lot of similarities That's going it. on there, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Well, the axe, you mean? Or the, or well, I mean, just is. there's somebody out there with. Of course, this is not an axe. This is what they call a uh, executioner. Yeah, it yeah, might right. be worse, but <laughs> I couldn't think of the name. But okay, all right. But, you know, so you've okay. got with an axe, and then you got you know this unmasked man, this masked man with uh, you know with an executioner. <laughs> so I mean that it, the hatchet, yeah, you know, that that's kind of like you see how you guys were in parallel, right? It's just yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. And Thunderburst and uh, Ides of March didn't help either, really, did it? I mean, that was what even... What was the story? I, 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 I think I've read it before, but just for those oh, that don't man. know, what was the story there? When I was with 
uh, maiden. Yes. We, uh, uh, Steve was the first person to introduce to me um, rehearsals of just the rhythm section. Up until then, every band I'd been in used to rehearse as a band all the time. And yet, when I got with Maiden, Steve started rehearsing just the two of us to get everything you know, tight. Um, and Thunderburst was a, a, a drum rolling pattern that I came up with. He came to me with um, ideas for that song, and I would do this drum roll, drum, drum pattern, as well as I threw in a couple of ideas. So when, we, when I was with, um, with Samson, we did the Head On album. We were still looking for a couple of other tracks to use. I said, well, there's a track that's an instrumental and played it to them. And I said, yeah, yeah, let's do it. So we did it as an instrumental. And then... Uh, Clive Burr, who had also joined, joined, joined Maiden, because, I mean, the, as you say, the connections between Samson and Maiden were like that. I mean, not, right. a, not only Clive Burr, ex-Samson drummer joins Iron Maiden, but ex-Samson singer joins Iron Maiden. I was asked back as well after um, after uh, we finished the tour together. Um, and uh, so we did this instrumental and Paul was still friends with Clive Burr, and Clive went over to Paul's house, and Paul stopped and said, look, you know, we finished the album. Do you want to hear it? Yeah, great. So put the side one on. Wonderful. Everything was great. Side two, up comes Thunderburst, hence, you know, because I took it to the band, that's why it was called Thunderburst. And Clive yeah. fell off his chair, <laughs> and he went, oh, my God, we're using that as an intro. And, and Paul went, what? What are you talking about? So he went in his bag and he pulled out a cassette and put a cassette on and there was I to march. Um, so as soon as this got heard uh, by the I Maiden camp, I was summoned to an e a meeting at EMI and Rod Smallwood was there and uh, Steve was there, a couple of the record company bots were there and a couple of the legal team from I Am Maiden. And I was told with no uncertainty Steve is going to take 50% of the songwriting royalties on Thunderburst. Um, and, and with Samson, we were a four-piece so, uh, songwriting team. We call ourselves Stab, which was Samson, Thunderstick, Aylmer and Bruce. Uh, Stab. So we only got 12.5% each mm. from, from the, uh, the um, Thunderburst. Thunderburst, Thunderburst track. Yeah, yeah. And Steve took fifty percent, and then he, then the the legal bod said, if you insist on trying to claim uh, songwriting credits on uh, Ides of March, we'll see you in court. And that was the that was the end of that. I mean, Paul, uh, the band, my, you know, Samson didn't want to know anything about it because it was something that had happened prior to me joining Samson. The management didn't want to know anything about it, so I was totally unrepresented by, you know, by anybody. And I went there to that meeting alone. Um, and the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> and who would have thought it would have worked out the way it worked out, right? Who yeah, would have yeah. thought Iron Maiden was the biggest band in the world, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we didn't know. So, But um, at the time, I mean, had I got songwriting on the Ides of March, it probably would have changed my life. But So so was it during... And, and, but, but, and do you, you mean you have 12% of it, don't you? 12.5%. No, not of Ides of March, no. Thunderburst. A, a Thunderburst only. Right, interesting. So you got... So he took 50% of your song. Yep, but I wasn't but allowed you to but you, but you didn't. you didn't even get 1% of his song. Correct, correct. And it's, no, the, and it's the same song. None of us did. None of us. Did. No, right. you know that's why I was. That's why I was called to the meeting, and told that right. this is the case, and that's the way it's going to be. And do you consider that? Do you consider that song a co-write between you and Steve, like a fifty-fifty kind of thing, or was it totally your thing? Or you know, when you're putting no, the no, music no, in? no, never totally my thing. Um, and Steve, if we broke it down, if we were to break the whole song down. Steve probably 75%, Barry 25% of that song. Okay. 
Okay. Right. Uh, but I mean, you know, it's many, many years, and a lot of blood has passed under the bridge. <laughs> so, yeah. so you know, it's just a, another one of those stories and the the fabled tales of Iron Maiden. Like I was supposed to have fallen asleep on on stage whilst playing with with Maiden. I mean, how ridiculous! <laughs> that's that, that's the story, right? That you. Oh, probably... how ridiculous! I mean, I don't know where that came from. Um, and I mean, it's just so stupid. <laughs> it's so stupid. I have actually got a copy of that gig that I did, the, the, the one that they were talking about that I supposedly fell asleep. And I am right on everything. I really am. I mean, I listened to it because I, I Steve said, you, you probably know, you've probably seen in the uh, video of the early days, Steve's mm -hmm. talking about it, and he went, oh, Thunder, uh, Barry or Thunderstick must have dropped something, and it wasn't his drumsticks. And, um, you know, so it was that I was, it was um, interpreted as the fact that I was out of it or whatever. But as I say, I have a copy of the live album, uh, sorry, the live, uh, vid live, the live performance that we did, and... Mm -hmm. There is no way that I'm, I, I I am out of it. It's um, I'm right. on everything. I am all over what, it. When looking at when the recording of this album, this wasn't the one where you recorded the same time as Iron Maiden Killers. We were in the studio at the no, same no, time. no, no. That, that was, was shot tactics. The next so, one. Yeah. So, but wait a second. How did this? How did this sequence go though? Like you have Ides of March survivors, with Killers, survivors, head on, uh, shot tactics, head tactics. No, no, I get that. But I mean, uh, Iron Maiden, they have Ides of March. Mm -hmm. I guess it's not released yet. While this is, <laughs> while this album's coming out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was Iron out. Maiden's yeah, not that... released yet. Right. right. And yeah. that's where they played the tape. Yeah. And yeah. they'd recorded it and then they knew what they were going to do with it. Yeah. Because yeah. they yeah, were yeah. using it as an intro, an intro right. type. So. so tell us about the music on this album, you know. Uh, well, that's, I mean, that was a, uh, we all, we stand on. We wanted to be a four-man writing team just to, you know, stop all, you know, any other problems <laughs> that we've just been talking about. So we were yeah. a four-man writing team, and we all brought something to all those songs. As I say, I, I, I've never regarded myself as purely a drummer. I am a musician. I write on keyboards. I do a lot of writing and arrangements and lyrics, and as I've said earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so there was quite a, a real a, a real buzz about about that album because everybody was just bringing ideas all the time. A lot of the counter melodies are mine. A lot of the uh, strange effects and you know the weird, wonderful things like walking out on you or the backwards choirs and all that kind of thing. And I did a lot of production on it. I I wanted a production credit, but I was never given one, and so I had to settle for additional ideas. Thunderstick on the on the sleeve. Right. <laughs> and I did I did all uh, Bruce's uh, uh, vocals tracks. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody else buggered off and went home. And I sat with the engineer and Bruce and did uh, and you know put down his vocal tracks with him. And I'm right. sure that if you get to talk to him, he will say yes, that's the truth. It did happen. So right. I mean, it was a, a lovely hodgepodge of ideas. Um, my playing is at my most flamboyant there, um, and it. it, it you know, it's got some really swing. It's got some swing there. You're yeah, playing yeah. A, a, above yeah. the, a, a ahead of the beat on a lot of the songs. Right. You yeah. know, um, yeah, yeah. I, I like it. it. It's I, like I, like I tell Giles, Giles, I love the drumming styles. It's quirky in a way, right? But yeah, it's yeah. it's upbeat and it's alive. Yeah. I liked it. Yeah. You know? So <laughs> that's that's why when Head Tactics came out, I hated it because um, the, we did Shot Tactics with Tony Platt. And he just come in from working with ACDC. Yeah. And we had the whole of Shot Tactics, the next album, was written. There you go, that one. Yeah. It had already been written. And we went into pre-production for two weeks with Tony Platt. And we literally pulled every track apart and started to rebuild each track. And he simplified my drumming. And I wasn't allowed to do the explosive tom you know tom fills and the and the crazy snare drum hi-hat stuff and all that that you will find on head on 
Um, so that was kind of the halfway house. And then when shot ta- uh, when head tactics came out, they were aiming at an American art- market because Bruce was already with Maiden by then. And they wanted it simplified so that, you know, the FM stations could pick it up and play it without it, anything being a little bit too OTT. And there you have it. So that's so why... What, the, what, what did they do with this? They they remixed it and changed yeah, some stuff? Yeah, 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 remixed it. Um, so what, I mean, how did they change your, how did they change your performance? Did they edit? They cut, they cut all the, the fills out and just made, you know, made the uh, very stationary pedestrian, uh, pedestrian beat. Sort of, sort of the, equi- the equivalent today of like what you would say quantizing the drums or something, but back yeah, then... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do, just to straighten it out a bit and make it make yeah. it boring. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Make it you know so that it fits. easy listening. I think uh, uh, easy right. listening American audience at the time. Yeah. That, that's interesting that they would do that because usually compilations such as this are just kind of like you know like when Bon Scott becomes a star with ACDC, they put out his fraternity stuff. The the previous band, you know, they go back and reissue these things, hoping that a few a few Maiden fans that don't have it will pick it up. Yeah. It's very un. It, it's it's not normal that they would. It's not typical, rather, that they would go. Let's try and get a radio song off something like this. Yeah, yeah. Because you'd I think mean, their focus, their focus would primarily just be keep Bruce known for Iron Maiden, rather than try and get a single yeah. off something that was yeah. sort of his, yeah. his former band. But anyway, I had nothing to do with that. I literally had to go up to EMI just to do a few autographs on it, and that was that, yeah. I mean, right, right. It's, it is very simplified. And so together. so the drumming on this was simplified, correct? Yeah, yeah. And then it was even more simplified oh, yeah. on he- head tactics. Exactly. Yeah, this was more ahead. of a performance. They go, we want you to perform, but yeah. downplay the performance. That's what they're yes. telling you here. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Interesting. So you're in the studio doing shock tactics, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. And right next to you, and this is a cool story too. Right next to you, it's Iron Maiden doing Killers. Doing killers, yeah, that's right. What was what was the sort of the camaraderie between you guys? Were you listening on each other's sessions? Uh, uh, I, can't, I, don't, uh, I know that Bruce was um, in and out um, of their session, and uh, uh, Clive definitely was was coming into our session and listening to stuff. Um, I don't remember Steve ever coming in. Not I, I, something I, I just don't know. I can't remember, but I don't mm-hmm. think it did. And I didn't go into the killers session, but there was always that you know, as you say, there was a comradeship, you know. But everybody was trying to better each other at the time. The new wave of British heavy metal came about because of punk, really. I mean, punk was at the time. You know, the be-all and end-all of everything. Promoters wanted to just put punk bands on. Uh, record labels only wanted to sign punk bands. And there were there were no other genres that were getting a look in. And, all right, we all know that punk gave us some, some really great acts. I love the Sex Pistols album. I think it really stood the test of time. And the energy of it, on it is fantastic. Uh, you have The Clash, you have The Damned, you know, bands like that, that Susie and the Banshees, you know, bands like that that actually were making music. But there was also a lot of dross out there as well that were hoping to get signed, people that couldn't play properly. So the new wave of British heavy metal were bands that were underground at the time, learning to play their instruments and learn, you know, so that, that they could one day get a signing. And then when punk had run its course and well and truly thrown the dummy out of the pram, suddenly promoters were looking around to see what the next thing was and record labels were. And that's how, New Wave of British Heavy Metal came about with such an upsurge of bands at the time. You know, huge Saxon, Samson, Iron Maiden, yeah. Def Leppard, Diamond Heads, you know, all these these bands just boom, they're suddenly there. And the press were writing about them. And that's how it became the next best thing. Um, there was a, a kind of rivalry between the bands, yeah, but it was a friendly rivalry. It was nothing... Nothing, you know, that the, the, you know, it's nothing to stop you from going and seeing each other's gigs when when you were playing live, you know. 
So I, I, I used to have dressing room duty when uh, at Clive's dressing room <laughs> for uh, for our maiden. I was put on dressing room duty to stop any untowards from coming. No, you can't go in there. It's a dressing room. Guys are getting ready or they just finished their set and they're getting changed. And he would do the same with Santa <laughs> and stand That's guard brilliant. outside the dressing room. <laughs> yeah. That's you know, great. So you got, you got, you got on well with Clive then. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've, yeah, yeah. You know, nothing against Nico. I mean, Nico is a wonderful drummer, and there are probably lots of listeners and viewers that are watching this at the time that would disagree with me. But I think Clive was more suited to me. Right, uh, I, I would agree just, with that. There was okay. a feel. I yeah, mean, there's a, yeah. a certain. It's a little more raw. It's a little and, more, and, uh, and you mentioned you mentioned something earlier. You said uh, two things. You mentioned earlier. I wanted to circle back on, if, if you okay. don't mind. You said you yeah. were asked. You were asked back. Now, you are, are you saying you yeah. were asked back to Samson? No, I made. Um, what happened was uh, we we been playing. We we toured together, and I can't remember what tour it was. I think it was uh, the Heavy Metal Crusade. I think it was that it was Samson headlining Iron Maiden second on the bill. Uh, Angel Witch opening and right. we did that tour and it finished uh, Christmas 1979 uh, okay. and at the time the drummer with, the, with Iron Maiden was Doug Sampson yes and he at the end of the uh, the end of the tour uh, according to Steve what was happening was that the sound engineer would have his faders at a reasonable level for the drums by the end of the gig, he pushed the faders up as far as they could go and couldn't give it any more. And this was because uh, Doug at the time had some kind of medical condition that he was losing power in his arms. And, you know, there were, I don't think there was any, um, I don't think that there was any kind of untoward, you're fired or anything like that. It was a mutual agreement between the band and Doug that he, he wasn't actually cutting it at the time. Um, wow. So we finished the tour, and we're just about going to the day before Christmas Eve. Phone goes, and I answered it, and he, he said, "Hello, it's Steve." And I said, "Steve, who?" And he went, "Harris," <laughs> as if you're supposed to know. Oh yeah, Steve. <laughs> All right, okay. Hi, right, what can I do for you? Um, are you can? Would you consider coming back and rejoining Maiden? And I was, uh, I literally was stunned. Um, he didn't want anything to do with the, the Thunderstick image. As you said earlier, it was already on the sounds cover and Thunderstick was really gaining momentum for me as a character um, yeah. and, was, and was getting a lot of publicity for, for the band, for Samson. Um, and Stephen obviously didn't want any of that at all. He wanted just me. So I said, can I have a couple of days? It's Christmas. Can I have a couple of days to think about it? And he said, well, you know, we've got we've got an itinerary that we're working at and, you know, we really need to know what's going, you know, what's going to happen. We need to put the band together because we've got all these these gigs and we're recording and blah, blah, blah. Um, and what happened was I said, how about you hire a drum kit and after Christmas I come down and play with the band? And he said, great, okay, let's do that. But in the meantime, Rod Smallwood phoned me up and said, you know, we need to, we need an answer because, you know, we're really under the cost here as far as uh, our timeline is concerned. And I said, I just can't. At the moment, I can't give you an answer. So for Christmas, it ruined my Christmas. I've got it all written in my diary because at the time I was keep, keeping a journal every day. Right. And uh, it's just you can you can see the the angst in, in my writing because I had I really didn't know what to do. So anyway, I went day after Boxing Day, which is uh, the day after Christmas Day in the UK and in Canada. Um, oh, and in Canada, okay. That's <laughs> but American okay. American uh, no, viewers would say, "What what the hell is he talking about?" <laughs> Boxing Day. So um, the day after Boxing Day, I went down, over to the East End. There was a foot and a half of snow. I only just managed to get over there. And they'd hired the drum kit, and I started playing with them. And Rod was there, and I can remember Rod at the time said, get this, he said, this band is going to be bigger than Led Zeppelin. And I thought, 
it's really you know admirable that you you have such a belief in your band that you're managing but to say that they're going to be bigger than Led Zeppelin but they are all they are both of a time and you can't you can't differentiate between the two you can't say Maiden are bigger because Led Zeppelin didn't have the facilities that I made them have now, like social media and, and just being able to, you know, kids with their phones, just you, you can have you can have it go up on social media within seconds or even live stream it and things like that. Led Zeppelin didn't have all that. They they had just a, a, a building of a following just by putting their albums out on great musicians. So uh, anyway, I thought that was wonderful. Anyway, so I played... I can't remember how many tracks, three or four tracks. We did um, Running Free, which was uh, the single they were just about to record. And by the time I got to the fourth track, I thought, this is not going to work because our styles, I think, are incompatible now. So finished playing, and Steve said, and? And I went, I still need a couple of days to think about it. Um, and I left it at that. There was never a definitive no or yes. I just need a couple of days to think about it. And uh, the phone call never came. And by that time, I had well and truly decided that I was sticking with the Thunderstick image and sticking with Samson. I mean, they were real pissed off when, you know, when they found out that I'd gone and, uh, and auditioned, as it were, for them. They weren't none too happy. Was that an audition in front of... Uh, fans or was that just no, no, a closed no, no. audition closed no, audition. Closed audition. it was just a rehearsal room they okay. hired the gear yeah. and we played in the rehearsal room okay. so uh yeah we the phone call never came and i never i never followed it up and i just kept on the course with with thunder city image you know yeah and then the next thing of course is that we're in the studio down at kingsway uh, which was in gillen's studio at the time phone goes and john mccoy picks it up comes into the control room and says, I just found out who the new drummer for uh, I Made This. And we went, oh, yeah, who's that? And he went, it's Clive Burr. And everybody went, what? <laughs> so we literally swapped places. I still had I Made This stenciled on my drum cases whilst I was yeah. playing with Samson in the early days. And and Clive, the same. He had uh, I'm, uh, Samson on his drum cases. <laughs> so you know, the really drum cases. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, God bless him. When we went to the uh, Clive's funeral after he died, um, the, everybody gathered at the house, at his house, and the garage or the garage door was open, and there were the original um, Samson drum cases in there. Wow, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. On that note, that was a great story, Barry. That was a wonderful story. Um, Thank you. Right, let's Let's go. Let's let's sort of circle back now to the beginning of this as we close off okay so the new album yeah looking yeah. forward to it lockdown lockdown's, put, yeah. uh, lockdown's coming out october 20th correct everybody could purchase it i guess online correct uh, that, yeah, there's, yeah. There's, yeah there's a pre-order um link online um just if you if you either go on to uh thunderstick facebook or um there is uh we have a, a fan page as well called thunderstick the thunderstick stormtroopers mm -hmm. or go on to my own barry graham perkis on facebook and you'll you'll find the link there uh for a pre-order okay. what we're doing this saturday uh tomorrow no oh, no no saturday today sorry hey saturday yes yeah, yeah this saturday yeah my mind has just been all <laughs> over the place um so uh, today um, there was a pre-order with a, um, a link to anybody that pre-orders so that they can hear the, the entire album uh, on SoundCloud. Perfect. Uh, only, only for this day. Um, so anybody that's putting an order in today for a pre-order, they will listen to the entire album and then at midnight tonight it gets taken off again and, and uh, nothing there until release date with the CDs. I've taken um, I've taken uh, possession of the CDs already, mm -hmm. and the the booklet is a 24-page booklet. Uh, nice yeah, yeah, the, the, the graphics in it are wonderful, and 
you know, I just hope everybody enjoys it. I really do because I, I I've kind of put a lot of heart and soul into this. And oh, I, I, just, I can definitely I can definitely say for me and Jimmy, we're 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 certainly looking forward to hearing it. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yes. And you know what? Uh, next time, uh, hopefully, uh, in six in, years' time. <laughs> I, six years to, well i mean i'd love to see you guys perform live one day so oh, hopefully you know, our, our cross our 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 we will somewhere down the line somewhere in the world hopefully we'll that would cross be paths. Great. yeah that yeah, would be yeah. great it would be wonderful nice all right guys have yourself right. a wonderful day everybody go pick up lockdown and catch barry in france and on, on the what is it on the seventh yeah seventh yeah that's it seventh. Yeah. with riot act great show lovely talking to you guys jimmy right. lovely giles thank you um Cheers, some mate. really good Talk some soon. really good questions and hopefully we'll, we'll be also along the line somewhere absolutely stay in touch mate all Cheers. right we'll do it. <laughs>